Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another episode of BNN. I've not quite decided what that acronym stands for, uh, so maybe we'll call it something new today. Who knows? Uh, so welcome to some friends checking in. Welcome, Gita, Jens, Lilia, Stacy, Gabriella, Bradley, Yulia, and Ethan. See all of you joining in. And Elaine and Liz, uh, my friends checking in. So as usual, we'll start with chanting the Ratana Sutta. And then after chanting the Ratana Sutta, we will be meditating guided by Ayasoma. And then Ayasoma will be giving a Dhamma talk. And then you can write in your questions for Ayasoma. Hallelujah. Hello, Marielle. Good to see you too. Uh, so we'll go ahead and start with the chanting. Uh, so if you would like to join in chanting, there's the link posted at the top of the chat window. And we'll uh, chant together. Thank you, Bangfin, and thank you all for joining us this evening. All right, so let's start um, by chanting the Ratna Sutta, and I believe you can find, you can follow along with the link on the live chat. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Bhagavato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Yani da Buddha Samagata ni bumma ni vaya ni vahantale ke Sameva Buddha sumana bhavantu atopisaka chasunantu bhasitam Tasma hi Buddha ni same tasa be me tam karo tamadu siya pajaya Diva charato chaharanti eva ling tasma hi ne rakata apamata Yan kin chibi Yam ratanang paditang Nano samanga titata gatena Idam pebunte ratanang paditang Etena sachena suvati hotu Kayang viragang amatang paditang Yadan chagasa kyamuni samahito Nate na dhamme na samati kinchi dhampi dhamme ratanang panitam Ete na sache na suvati hotu Yam buddha se to parivan na yisu ching samadhi manantari kanyamahu Samadhina te na samo na vinjati dhampi dhamme ratanang panitam E te na sache na suvati hotu Ye bhungala artha satam prasatha chatari ye dhani yugani hondi Te da ki neya sugata sasavaka e te sudinna ni maha palani Idam pi sangke ratanang panitang e te na sache na suvati hotu Ye supayuta manasa dalena ni kami no go tamasasanami Te pati pata matang vigai halan tamutanim puting punjamana Idam pi sangke ratanang panitang e te na sache na suvati hotu 
ยาทินดาคิโลพัทธิงสิโตสิยาชาตุมปิวะเทปิยาสัมปะคัมปิโยชาตุปมังสัมบุริสังวดามิโยอริยสัจจานิยเบจปัสสทิเอดัมปิสังเกวตนังปณิตังเอเทนัสเชนัสุวัติหตุเยอริยสัจจานิเวบาวันติกัมเีรปัญเยนัสุเดสิตานิกินชาปิเทหนทิปุสัปมาตานเทบาบังอาตมังอานิยันติอิดัมปิสังเหตรัตนังปณิตังเกตินัสเชนัสุวัติหตุสหวาสดาสนาสัมปดายาทายาสุธรรมะจะหิตาบวันจีสกายเดทิวิจิกิจิตันชาสิลัมปะตังบาปิยาตติกินจีชาตุหะภายเยิชาเวปมุตโตชาชาพิธานานิอาบัมโบคาตุงเอดัมปิสังเกวัตนังปณิตังเอเทนัสเชนัสุวัติหตุขินชาปิโสคัมมังคโรติปาปะคังกายนาวาชาอุรเจตสาวะอาบัมโบโสธาสปะทิชาดายาบัมบาธาเดตปะดาสบุตังเอดัมปิสังเกวัตนังปณิตังเอเทนัสเชนัสุวัติหตุวานาปะกุมเบยาธาบุสิดังเอกมารามาเสพธรรมสมิงเอมเฮทัตุปะมังธรรมบารังเดสัยนิบาณกามิงบารมังเอตายะเอดัมปิบุตเทวตนังปณิตังเอเทนัสเชนัสุวัติหตุวารุวารัญญูวารดูวาราหโรวานุตารุธรรมบารังเดสัยเอดัมปิบุตเทวตนังปณิตังเอเทนัสเชนัสุวัติหตุขีนังภูรานังนาวังนาติสัมบาวังเบราตาจิตตายเตเกบาวัสมิงเตขีนาบิดาวิรุลหินชันนาเดมปันติทีรายาทายังปาริปโอเอดัมปิสังเกวัตนังปณิตังเอเทนัสเชนัสุวัติหตุยานิทบุตานิสัมมาทานิบุมมานิบายานิบาลตะเลเกทัตตากะทังเดบมนุสปุจิตังบุตตังนามาสัมสุวัติโหตุยานิทบุตานิสัมมาทานิบุมมานิบายานิบาลตะเลเกทัตตากะทังเดวะมนุสปุจิตังธรรมังนามาสัมมาสุวัติหตุยานิทบุตานิสัมมาทานิบุมมานิบายานิบาลตะเลเกทัตตากะทังเดวะมนุสปุจิตังสังฆมนามาสัมมาสุวัติหตุเอเทนัสจาวันเจนะดูกาบุปัสสนตุเทเอเทนัสจาวันเจนะบายาบุปัสสนตุเทเอเทนัสจาวันเจนะรกาบุปัสสนตุเทโอเค and hello to Richard and Adriana Happy to see you joining in as well. And at this time, we'll follow Ayasoma's meditation instructions. She's starting with tea meditation, apparently <laughs> mindfulness of taste. Right, so you can 
put yourself in a comfortable position. You can drink some tea if you need to. <laughs> if it helps you feel comfortable. Rocking your body side to side. Stretching if needed. Well, you can close your eyes or leave them slightly open if you're a little tired at this time of day. You take a moment to relax your entire body from the tip of the head to the tip of the toes. Releasing any point of tension you might find in the body. Relaxing your head, the forehead, the jaw, the mouth, the throat. Relaxing your shoulders, your torso, your belly. Relaxing your legs. your arms, relaxing your entire body. And by taking a few deep breaths, we also Relax our breathing. Pointing our attention towards the breath, but letting go of any craving of control. Letting the breath be nice and smooth. Or coarse and brittle. Whatever it's like, let it be. Let it, let it do its thing. And observe it. Each in-breath and out-breath.
lifting our attention to the breath and keeping it there. Sustaining our attention. So that we're knowing in every moment if we're breathing in or if we're breathing out. We are aware if the breath is short or if it's long. We're aware of every tingling sensation in the nostril. Every moment we're aware. Looking at the breath like it was the most interesting thing in the world. A vital concern. With genuine curiosity trying to understand our experience in every moment. Remembering to keep a smile on your face. Because breathing is a joyful experience. Watching the breath is a joyful experience. Being mindful is a joyful experience.
If we get distracted by thoughts or sounds, we bring back our attention to the breath without becoming averse with ourselves, but rejoicing in our moment of wisdom, in our moment of mindfulness. And we bring back our attention to every in-breath and out-breath. Cultivating curiosity and understanding. If we watch closely at our experience, we'll notice how it's constantly changing. Every moment is different from the one before. as we keep nourishing our mindfulness, 
our awareness of the present moment, our understanding of the breath. Joy appears in the mind. Joy is nourished. Joy keeps growing. Permeating the mind. With happiness. Peace. Contentment. Relaxation. All we needed to do was to pay attention to the present moment. Let go of our cravings, let go of our aversion. Just dwell in the present moment. And happiness arises. Reliable happiness, always available to us. Whenever we like, whenever we decide to pursue it, it's there. So why would we pursue our cravings? Why would we pursue our aversions? When we can pursue happiness, contentment, peace. So let's wish for ourselves to always be happy, to always be peaceful, to always be safe, to be free from suffering, to be free from greed, hatred, and delusion. And allow our minds to be imbued with loving kindness, with goodwill towards ourselves. Cultivating metta, cultivating loving friendliness, nourishing it. Letting it grow and pervade our mind.
and then expanding our loving kindness to all sentient beings, humans and non-humans, in the entire universe. May everyone be happy, peaceful, safe, May everyone be free from suffering. May everyone be free from greed, hatred, and delusion. May everyone attain supreme, blissful Nibbana. Well, thank you, Aya Soma. Uh, that was lovely. And hello to Anat, Christopher, and Lucas. Happy to see you guys joining in as well. Uh, and at this time, uh, you get a opportunity to listen to Dhamma from Aya Soma, my sister from another mister. Uh, and uh, on the topic of the second of the ten parami, which is sila, morality. Uh, so please, whenever you're ready. Thank you, Bhante. So I thought that tonight I was going to talk about truthfulness. So I thought the truth is that we didn't read the schedule. <laughs> and what we scheduled tonight is in fact sila. Which is too much related. <laughs> Stan just stepped on, on top of the computer, so maybe he destroyed something. No? It's all good? All right. Stan is the cat, so you know. <laughs> um, 
one who is hiding over here, but might do a little cameo. All right, so see ya. One of the most beautiful topics, actually. Which generally is translated as um, a term that is translated as morality. Um, and that many converts. Actually, one of the first uh, Buddhist monks that I met was the, from the Czech Republic, and he um, started off in his practice, um, well, when he encountered the Buddhist teachings as an atheist. And Ashinov Damar is his name. He is the monk who kind of introduced me or made me very interested in the path. And he has um, this beautiful story, um, which I'll tell you perhaps another time, but um, <laughs> I'll tell you a, a little part of it right now, which was that when he encountered the teachings, it was a really hard time um, for him. It was after the war and um, there was lots of things going in his life and he had to uh, go into exile in um, Switzerland from, um, from uh, the Czech Republic where he's from. And while he was there and struggling with all his suffering, uh, a Marxist friend of his uh, gave him this booklet of the Buddha, the Buddhist teachings. And he was like, oh, okay, well, freedom from suffering, that's interesting. And so as he was telling me the story, he was like, so I took this book and I was like, oh, let me skip to the part of morality, let me skip the part of the precepts, <laughs> and let me go straight to the meditation instructions. So he rented out this um, uh, little house, little shack in the woods for like two months and went to the to the woods and just practice meditation full stop. Like that, that was the only thing he did. But that was not enough. So he kept practicing for 20 years, um, purely in a sort of um, kind of secular way, focusing mainly, if not exclusively, on the teachings of meditation. He also started his own, uh, actually ended up ending up telling you the story of Ashinata. <laughs> Um, he started his own meditation center, one of the first secular meditation centers in Europe. And then at a certain point, he kind of understood, or so he told me, the purpose of what he perceived as um, not necessary, like the robe or the bowl, the alms bowl, or things that he thought that were, you know, kind of like the trappings of religion, but weren't quite relevant to him. And um, anyway, long story short, then he decided to ordain and he's been now an ordained monastic for over 20 years. So the reason why I'm sharing this story uh, was that normally um, it's very common that whether we have an atheist background or a religious background of any sort, um, that, and we're not born Buddhist, that when we encounter the teachings of the Buddha, we kind of like skip the morality part or overlook it, thinking that we're already pretty much a good person already, so, <laughs> so we need to focus on the sort of important stuff, which is perhaps cultivating wisdom, cultivating understanding, doing lots of meditation practice. And that's a big mistake. It's truly not understanding the teachings of the Buddha in the first place. And I was no different, actually. At the very beginning, I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, that's all well and good. You know, I've done this and I've done that. I'm pretty good, okay. You know, yeah, I mean, some of my friends don't even do that. Like, I think um, I'm really at a good point. But actually, Buddhist morality has quite lofty expectations. It's not just being an average good person. It's not being somewhat truthful, but 
a white lie is okay. It's not like, you know, not stealing from your friends or your, you know, people in your community, but it's okay to steal from corporations. It's no stealing altogether. So, so not, you know, just, it's okay to get drunk a bunch of times here and there at the pub, just as long as we don't get too many messes. It's not drinking altogether. Lots and lots of um, things that we do that really, that actually where we realize that the bar is much higher, you know, like not, not feeling just human beings, but not killing at all. Very, very difficult for some of us when we start this practice. It was very difficult for me not to kill mosquitoes. I thought they deserved to die. <laughs> How bizarre that I thought that my, my life was more precious than um, someone else's life. So there's quite a bit of a, a sort of lofty expectation in comparison to what we are. And when we stop thinking about it in terms of just morality, in terms of things to do, in terms of commandments, oh, I'm supposed to not be drinking, okay, boring, okay, I'll do it perhaps on your positive day, or maybe I'll take a week here and there, or um, I don't know, well, mosquitoes are really annoying, so I'll try not to kill them, but okay, well, well whatever, I'm still like not killing humans, it's okay. When we start thinking about it, instead of commandments as actually the um, another of the translations of sila, which is habits. So reflection, a contemplation of training in sila, training to create new habits then we see that it's no different than meditation practice. It's no different, but it's also essential. Essential and also complementary. There is not one without the other. So as we go, as we move forward with our Buddhist practice, we start realizing that if we don't radically change our habits, our deep-rooted habits, there's very little progress we can make in the path. And without really looking, without taking precepts and shifting our perception, shifting our way of doing things, we have no foundation. So it's very important to create a solid foundation for a house Otherwise, it crumbles, right? So in the same way, it's important, it's a vital um, concern to, to really understand why we're taking precepts and what are we trying to do and watching our practice in every single moment. Because actually, to be quite frank, we have more time to practice this type of meditation than to practice sitting meditation. So not, so overlooking this part means that fundamentally we're doing very, very little meditation. And when we're actually preoccupied instead of building our sila, creating new habits, then the progress that we're making is much faster. It means that we're meditating the whole day. How beautiful. Practical. So it's interesting because once again, we're talking about foundation and um, here at the, at the um, at Empty Cloud, uh, we're currently, instead of growing lawns, there's like a lot of land here. So it, it has been up until recently covered up with lawn. So we're switching it now to, <laughs> 
um, growing food for all sentient beings, so for birds, for um, insects, for bees, for everyone. So like we started getting the lawn to go wild and uh, other parts um, has been covered up with uh, cardboard um, and covered up with uh, compost and um, other types of topsoil. And the purpose of that is actually to build the soil. So it's kind of interesting. A lot of times when we think about growing um, stuff, we, we talk about, oh, I need to grow that plant and I need to grow garden and I need to grow this and I need to grow that. Um, but we don't understand that if we grow, we try growing whatever we want to grow in an unfertile soil, nothing will last. Everything will crumble very quickly. Perhaps it will last a couple of days, perhaps a couple of weeks, perhaps a couple of months. But the soil is the most important thing. The soil, actually, if you Google the lack of good soil and the problem that the lack of good soil is creating um, due to the consequences of modern agriculture, you see how desperate actually the sort of food situation in the world is. Even though we have this appearance of so much prosperity, that prosperity is actually very temporary, very um, imperialist, very imperial, perilous, something like that in English. Um, so yeah, that's, there are so many different ways in which we can grow soil, which will then make it easier for plants to, to grow, which is what we're currently, what, what my mind is really obsessing about right now, reading lots and lots of plant <laughs> lots of information on, um, Lots of ways, some things we have tried already at the summer house in the place where we were before. And now because we have lots more land, lots of more land, but, um, there's also trees that we're planting. Um, lots of different great things that are coming in that have been donated by people who are really great. <laughs> so we are reforesting the planets to reforest the land and at the same time grow in big species, do lots of, lots of different things. So it's very interesting because it's also the first time that I um, have experienced for um, sort of longer than a couple of days time um, living in the suburbs. So at the very beginning, I was a little bit confused because I was hearing all this noise and I thought that um, as soon as spring started and I thought that it was um, the construction work people that were working nonstop. And then it occurred to me that actually <laughs> after a month, I was like, oh, this construction is like nonstop. It's insane. Then it occurred to me that it's just everybody here using the lawnmower and the leaf blower, which make these like really strong strong sounds that were not existing throughout the winter. So me, I have only lived in, um, well, in Europe where people do not have lawns. <laughs> and in the United States, I lived in New York City where very few people have lawns. And if they have, like we have in, uh, in, in Rockaway, they're definitely not well fed. So they're like these tiny things. <laughs> so I started observing um, very, very interesting process how people get, there's a whole like sort of culture in, in, in this country behind this, um, behind this lawn, which is completely absurd because like they grow this grass that is not native and apparently it's like per format, uh, like standard everywhere. Uh, since it's not native, it's subject to diseases and also, of course, all the weeds which are native uh, take over, have a sort of, um, are stronger than the, than the grass. So then people um, have to use pesticides on the lawn, which then like impoverishes um, the soil. So then they need to put this fertilizer on the lawn. So 
<laughs> to get the grass to grow, which then also gets the the weeds, of course, to grow even more. So then more pesticide on the lawn, um, and <laughs> which then kills the lawn. So you have to regrow the lawn. Like, wow, is this such a great example of samsara? Like this sort of endless birth and rebirth, which is like a whole massive suffering right there in like one patch of lawn and then on top of that with you know the whole like uh removing all the um, the resi residue of the grass which then not doesn't nourish the the lawn and uh, removing the the leaves so that everything looks perfect so also removes nutrients from the soil the whole craziness that i had no idea actually existed i thought the lawn was a, a lot less um <laughs> less high maintenance so anyway this is i realized what is the whole noise but at the same time it's very interesting to me to really look at how impoverished the soil is when you treat it that way and how it's subject to disease to infestation to suffering and how much there is such a um an incredible parallel uh with everything is dhamma, right? So like with our minds. So whenever we start thinking that, for example, the only thing that we need to do is meditation. So it's kind of like you know, try focusing on one thing without actually creating a foundation for the meditation to thrive, for a practice to grow. But when we start um, really changing our habits, really taking the precepts seriously, really working on it, then we start noticing how everything is so much easier. So if you now lift up, it has rained um, in the backyard on the, on the cardboard, you lift it up and there are lots of like cute little worms already coming and they're all like really happy doing all the work for you. For us, actually, <laughs> fertilizing the soil. It was incredible. Just in a couple of days, I was really amazed in this really impoverished soil that, that we have in, in, in one area. And the chickens uh, go there and they're also really interested and they start fertilizing the soil as well. Incredible. Very, like, uh, hands off. I was also studying how all the native species, if you start putting the native species, then you work less and less instead of more and more. So in the same way, if we start really uh, watching our habits, really working on our habits, we're gonna start working less and less in meditation because it's gonna be a really pleasant experience. So that's what the Buddha tells us, that when we start cultivating sila, there are two things that happen. One, is a big gift, we're giving a big gift to ourselves. Because there is no ground, for example, for remorse, for torment, for horrible things coming up from the past that obstruct our meditation. We can do sila musahi, recollection of our own goodness, and really delight and be blissed out and go, wow, yeah, I'm a really great person, yay. For example, when I had, um, you know, less than a great uh, relationship with my parents for several different reasons, and I was behaving in a certain way, in meditation, I would constantly get at a certain point, ooh, a sense of lots of like really ugly feelings resur resurfacing. Now that I've made an effort or making an effort, on cultivating kindness and consideration <coughs> excuse me, towards my parents. Ooh, all of this is shutting off a little bit, a little bit. It has nothing to do with their behavior. It has to do with my behavior. It has to do with the fact that I don't have remorse for things that I have done in the past. There is no ground for, for ugly thing, 
ugliness to arise. So it's more like, oh, okay, well, I'm doing my best. This is good. This is reassuring. It's wonderful. If I'm outside and creepy things come on me, at the very beginning of my practice, there was so much hostility. Which, oh, what is that creature? Oh, the spider. Oh, why did that? Now it's like, oh, I love beauty. If I think, even, sometimes it's just like, uh, just made enough, right? It's wonderful. That's the equanimity. So that's the first gift that we we have. And then there's the gift that we give to others. We start leading by example. So we become incredible kalyanamitas. We become spiritual friends for others. Beautiful. What an incredible gift one can give to the world. And we become then also um, a, a, how do you say it? Um, paragon of safety for all living beings. When you go to a monastery, for example, you'll see that all the um, all the animals. It's so funny, like when people come to Empty Cloud Monastery or the Rocky Summer House and they meet the chickens, usually the first thing that they say is like, oh, who said that chickens were, you know, kind of grumpy and nasty and, I don't know, like hostile. Uh, but the chickens that are here are so sweet and kind and friendly. They're like cats and dogs. And I would say, yeah, of course, because we treat them like cats and dogs. We don't treat them like machines that produce eggs or machines that will produce meat. They're rescue chickens. We're happy for them to be here, whether they lay eggs or they don't lay uh, lay eggs. Actually, most of the time, they don't even lay eggs in the coop, so we don't have the eggs. (laughs) Don't find any eggs. Other sentient beings around here find find the eggs. If anyone finds the eggs. Maybe the ground, the worms in the end, find the eggs. So yeah, they're happy, they're sweet, they know they are safe. When you go to monasteries, they're always here at the monastery. It's so beautiful, finding the ground. When I went to Sati Saraniya uh, last year, it was it was hunting season, and all the deer were up. Sati Saraniya, because they knew it was a safe space. They knew that nothing could happen there. So I have this beautiful quote from the Buddha in Anguttara Nikaya 839, uh, where the Buddha talks about the five precepts. Here, a noble disciple, having abandoned the destruction of life, abstains from the destruction of life, steep. And then he also goes with stealing, sexual misconduct, lying, um, using intoxicants. And he says, in doing so, he gives freedom from danger, freedom from animosity, freedom from oppression to limitless numbers of beings. In giving freedom from danger, freedom from animosity, freedom from oppression to limitless numbers of beings, he gains a share in limitless freedom from danger freedom from animosity, and freedom from oppression. This is the first gift, the first great gift, original, long-standing, traditional, ancient, unadulterated, unadulterated from the beginning, that is not open to suspicion, will never be open to suspicion, and is unfaulted by knowledgeable contemplatives and brahmins. So much damasuka. So beautiful, an incredible gift to the world that is entirely blameless by anyone. No one can say anything against producing such an incredible effect in the world. Isn't it beautiful that Stan, the cat, knows that he's free from danger right now? He's sitting very peacefully, um, 
on Bhante Sudasa's lap. He knows that Bhante will never do anything that harms him, that may harm him. And so do the chickens. There is a complete trust. It's incredible, beautiful. Beautiful gift that we can give um, to others and to ourselves, which is when we also see that by practicing in this way, we start eroding a sense of separation from ourselves and others. We start understanding deeply the implications of metta, of how may everyone be happy, not may I be happy and other people not happy, or may they be happy and not me happy, but may we all be happy. May we all purify our minds. And with this delightful mind, then we can obviously get easily concentrated, as the Buddha always says, a happy mind gets easily concentrated. And a happy mind is the product of virtue, of cultivating wholesome actions through body, speech, and mind in every moment. Really looking at our actions, really looking at our words, really looking at our livelihood, and always thinking, what can I improve? How can I do this better? But not in, with a faulty mind, but with an aspirational mind really realizing, wow, yes, I'm really putting a lot of effort into this. And then naturally we'll stop looking at the things we haven't achieved and we will start looking at how pure, how much purer the mind is. Looking at how much better our sila is, how much better our habits are becoming and how much weaker the bad habits are becoming. And then we're working. Yay! <laughs> All right. And take more precepts, you know? It's, it's always great. That's what caught me in robes. I was like, hmm, these precepts really work. Give me more, give me more. All right, so that's all I have to say on the subject matter. Okay, well, thank you, Aya Soma, for that lovely talk on Sila. And hello to some more friends joining in. Uh, so I see uh, Karen Jo uh, and Poonam Sood, welcome. And if you have any questions or comments, please go ahead and type them into the live chat. Uh, so Karen said, yes, Marxists, with the fist emoji. <laughs> um, I think because of the story about the Marxist yeah. giving the monk, well, the future monk, the Buddhist book. Um, Marielle says, food for everyone. I can't wait to be able to see in person what that garden looks like. And Marielle says, also, I'm glad you are the one giving the talk today, Aya. You have a lot of wisdom, but it's a different type from Bhante's wisdom. So I like having a balance of the two of you. Dharma and two different wisdoms at once, that's really lovely. And Adriana says, I am loving all this talk about soil and sila. Hmm, or should I say I'm digging all the talk about soil and sila, LOL. Oh, that's very good fun. Yeah. And there's no questions. So if you have any questions, please feel free to type them in. Uh, otherwise, that might be it. Lavanya says, I cannot wait to hug the chickens. <laughs> See, they're very popular. Yeah, you can walk right up to them and pet them, and they don't mind at all. Yeah, Ooh, happy. we have a question. Gabriella asks, in Anguttara Nikaya 3.86, the Buddha describes highly spiritually developed person is able to make mistakes in the training, but can a stream enterer make mistakes in sila? That's a good question for Bhante. See, all the technical questions are good for Bhante because I like to talk about things that um, I've experienced. <laughs> so since I'm not a stray banter yet, unfortunately, but 
I think it was kind of clear. <laughs> no, no disguise. I think that's good for you. How about you answer that since the the param paramis are are for both the very the surprise monk questions. Well, in the Kosambhya Sutta, the Buddha states that a stream enterer will still occasionally make minor errors in sila. They won't commit major errors, but they still will occasionally commit minor errors, uh, but that they will immediately feel remorse and uh, they will confess it to another practitioner and they will try to make amends. So yes, they can make minor errors, but they will immediately see their mistake and try to uh, fix their their mistake. But yes, this doesn't mean though that a stray mentor does not have incredible sila. So if someone claims to be a stray mentor and doesn't have what we perceive as impeccable sila, I think it's not. He's not a. They are not a stray mentor. Okay, and Gabriella also asks, Sila, when described as being loved by the wise, I'm not exactly sure if they're referring only to the five precepts, the ten, or the patimoka. What is the conduct loved by the wise? Um, I would say that it's uh, the, the qualities rather than the precepts per se. So we have to obsess about the precepts, but the precepts are a means to an end. So the result is um, an impeccable conduct. And honestly, if you actually see the um, sort of the genesis of the Patimaka, it's not that the Buddha um, started the monastic order and he was like, okay, and here you go, here are the rules. By the way, you're gonna have a 311 and you're gonna have a two, how many do we have? Uh, 227. 227, I was very curious numbers. <laughs> so it wasn't that way, but there are actually um, training rules that were created because of unwholesome behaviors or because of lack of sila. So I would say that actually if someone practices the five precepts impeccably, the five precepts impeccably, then you will have impeccable sila. But realistically speaking, we start with without impeccable sila. <laughs> so uh, sometimes it's helpful to get a few precepts more here and there, um, adding to the staff as trainings in order to develop the habits. But once again, the the objective is is developing wholesome habits. Now, how you develop them is a whole other, other kind of worms. So I wouldn't say that the wise are praising one form of habit. They're not like, well, you know, the Mahayana is the higher vehicle and the Theravada is the lower vehicle or anything like that. But rather it's what's the markup of this person's um, morality, habits, tendencies. What is the flavor? So that is what is praised universally. And in fact, you'll see that it doesn't matter whether um, a practitioner is from the Mahayana tradition, Vajrayana tradition, or Theravada uh, tradition, if they have remarkable qualities, they will be praised by the wise universally. I yet have to meet, for example, um, um, an advanced monastic in the Theravada tradition that does not praise um, the qualities developed by the Dalai Lama, for example, or the qualities developed by Master Sengyen in the Mahayana tradition, and vice versa, the qualities developed by Ajahn Chah. So credit, they're all pretty well known within the, across the traditions because of the qualities, not because of the means through which they achieved it. Okay, and Karen asks, could you elaborate further on precepts? How do we strengthen those habits? Um, 
so I can share my experience. <laughs> so I find, obviously, I, I follow the Theravada traditions when it comes to precepts. So, so in different Buddhist traditions, there are different traditions, obviously. So I started with, uh, well, first I started with nothing. For the first year of my practice, uh, I was um, somewhat following the five precepts without actually having taken them formally because I, wa I wanted to be a sort of flexi flexitarian in terms of precepts. <laughs> and I had the whole thing about didn't, I didn't like labels, etc. So it took me a year to actually take the Buddhist label, even though I was basically a Buddhist. Um, so I'm absolutely starting from taking the five precepts and really committing to the practice, really looking, using them as, as training, training rules. So once I took the five precepts, then I really committed to the five precepts. And I committed to not killing. So watching my mind, watching the tendencies. So that's the reason why we take precepts is to create the conditions for us to watch our mind and understand what the problem is. So up until taking the precept of not killing, for example, I had no idea that I had killing instincts in my mind. I had it perhaps a sort of kind of vague idea that, vague understanding that I like to kill insects, but I didn't really understand what was going on in my mind when I would relate to insects. So theoretically, I thought that I could stop overnight. I was like, okay, yeah, whatever, I'll stop killing ants, I'll stop killing mosquitoes. But actually, that was not the case. I mean, I did stop overnight, somewhat. <laughs> but my mind didn't stop wanting to kill, didn't, want, didn't stop wanting to harm overnight. So it's actually a long process. I think I overcame it with two or three years of strict um, practice. To the point that then I extirpated that. I uprooted it from my mind. So now my mind, when I see an insect, there, the thought doesn't arise anymore. So taking the precept of not killing created, once again, the conditions for me to understand, wow, there's a lot of hatred in my mind. There's a lot of ill will in my mind. Then I trained myself by not harming. So I didn't go to compassion because I couldn't possibly generate compassion towards um, the ant that was annoying the hell out of me. Uh, the ants, actually, that were going through all the sugar and the, um, and the honey and even actually the shampoo or anything that they perceive as slightly sweet. They will swarm on it constantly on a daily basis. I couldn't possibly have compassion towards them, but I could stop harming them. So you train yourself over and over again. And then by training in non-harming, you create the conditions, the room in your mind for compassion to arise. And for the harm, the ill will and the harming others to completely dissipate and erode. Like, doesn't exist anymore. There's no trace. And that you'll see with every single precept, if you truly take it as a, not just as a commandment or something that you are supposed to do, but rather as a means to an end, a means to really understand the mind. So then, for example, using intoxicants was not chore I would have never been the person oh yeah like my religion tells me not to drink so I won't drink I was like oh, rubbish drinking is fun I'll keep on doing it but then actually by abstaining from drinking then you start understanding first of all you, you start maturing this passion you're like well actually it's kind of great not being hungover that's kind of great how my it's facilitating my practice of mindfulness it's kind of great actually to be more in sync with reality. Actually, it's kind of great not to send really weird texts or emails 
while intoxicated. It's really great not to say hostile things to people uh, while intoxicated or, you know, be conceited towards people because perhaps the alcohol is making me arrogant or something. It's kind of great. Actually, I like this person much better. So by this passion comes cessation. So now I'm completely uninterested. I used to drink quite a lot in the past. Zero, but it's not a problem. It's there is no craving. Extirpated the craving and thrown it away. No interest in drinking altogether. So you'll see it with everything that you're one piece of at a time, you start working and and really making progress um, in the path. Okay. And Maitreya T asks, by practicing sila, are we generating merit? Can it be considered a form of dana? Absolutely, yes. That's what Buddha said. It's the biggest gift in the world that you can give to people. It's the gift of safety, being free from danger. What an incredible... Oh, you're like, oh, I really feel comfortable being here. Really, it's a safe space. You hear so often people looking for a safe space. That's the biggest gift, one of the biggest gifts you can give to people. And by people, I mean all sentient beings. Okay. And uh, Marielle asks, um, could we ever have a talk on Buddhism and psychedelics? or the use of plants for spiritual reasons. If plants are empty bodies, as mentioned this morning, then I'm curious on Buddhism's take on these specific plants. Well, that's a talk for Bhante Sudhasa. Bhante Sudhasa will not give that talk. <laughs> well, perhaps then um, you can ask questions to Bhante Sudhasa during monk chat. <laughs> yes, that's a much better idea. <laughs> Um, then Gabriella asks, is it a safe bet to avoid breaking the five precepts, avoiding divisive and harsh speech, avoid frivolous speech and covetousness, ill will and wrong view, as well as right livelihood? Yeah, absolutely. Of course, one should practice as much as they can. Actually, they should devout themselves to practicing the, the five precepts, but also understanding that we're not quite there yet. So... Also be forgiving with ourselves. Otherwise it can be very, this, this path has to be a path of joy. If we start like flagellating ourselves because we're not that great, for example, our speech is imperfect, then we can't make much, our, much progress. Our, our speech won't be ever perfect because we don't allow ourselves the time to train ourselves in right speech. So we really have to understand um, each one of these precepts as no different than actually getting a PhD, for example, in physics. It's not that you take it overnight. You have to learn and you have to train yourself. You have to train your mind to think in a certain way. So if we think that just because we read, um, oh, right speech, yes, okay, um, not use divisive speech, etc. No, it has to do I mean, either you have cultivated already in previous lifetimes, but if you haven't, then you have to commit to yourself from practicing over and over again. So you'll make mistakes and you'll use harsh speech and then you're like, okay, I'm sorry. My speech wasn't skillful. I forgive myself. I'll try and do better next time. Over and over again with every single thing that we do. Always acknowledging our faults and committing to do better. Um, then Muriel says you mentioned this morning that I probably talked to devas when I talked to plants and I remembered last year I traveled throughout Myanmar for a month and a half and in a random town I came across a national medium festival so mediums from all over the country were reunited there for some reason these mediums were Buddhist but mixed with not worship which are some local traditions um, the point is, this woman told me a lot of things, and one of them was that I had been there before, and that I have a kind heart, which is why spirits like me and help me. Aww. Perhaps these spirits are devas. It was really weird, and I actually don't remember much, but that's one thing I remember. Yeah, probably. Yeah, I mean, I mentioned that because I remembered you 
um, talking about plants and your relationship with plants. So yeah, absolutely, as Bonte mentioned, it's present in pretty much any sort of spiritual tradition and actually even within Catholicism, um, like you'll see, for example, shamanism, uh, wherever shamanism is practiced, there is also Catholicism, so they are interconnected or forms of Christianity. Um, so there's always still like the pre-existent um, kind of connecting with, um, with different devas. And in, in Italy as well, actually, I, my belief is that um, pretty much all the saints were coming from some kind of deva that was worshipped in the past. So, yeah, I don't know exactly what your experience um, is, but sounds likely to me. Also, okay. you have an affinity towards Buddhism, so probably you were in Burma recently in the past, past lives. <laughs> but we shouldn't speculate about the past. And Gabriella says, I was born a Catholic. My uncle was Opus Dei. Flagellation is a family tradition. You know about Opus Dei. Yes, I've heard. Um, well, mainly what I know about Opus Dei is that I have lots and lots of children. Um, <laughs> that's what they're known well, about in, in Italy. Some um, of them do, but some are celibate. Um, but I think her point was that they also have a tradition of... Self-flagellation. Yeah, they yeah. do a lot of weird things. I don't know too much about it. Um, I, once again, the reason why I was mentioning the children was just because that's what my friends and I were talking about. Because usually, like, you would know that a family um, was off the stay because they had, like, 15 or 20 children. And say my family only has three children and the average family in Italy these days. Nobody, like, really reproduces that much except for the off the stay. Um, but, yeah, I would say you have to um kind of come to terms with that cultural conditioning that you've had and with that tendency of self-flagellation watch it understand it and then start shutting it letting it go so watching it with as no other thing no different than any other thing that comes up in meditation you really have to become friends with um all the different things that um, causes and conditions that have created um, your suffering right now. Not taking them too seriously, not going like, oh, wow, I had to bring it out, it's terrible. Every single person has had a really terrible thing happening. So you have to like learn how to you know, take it with lightness and also start uh, laughing about it. Looking at what I normally do with my own self is looking at the surreal aspects of it and start laughing with, about them. Sometimes I tell Rampe some weird stories about how I was raised or the Italian culture and start laughing about it. And he's like, that's weird. I'm like, yeah, it's weird. In fact, it's true. <laughs> but what are you going to do? It is what it is. Okay, and Bradley asks, can you talk a bit about morality in relation to buying and eating animal products? Mm, that's a whole <laughs> dumb talk right there. But um, I'll try to do long story short. And my approach is harm reduction. So being realistic with one's situation. And assessing. So if you're eating meat every single day, perhaps even if you have the aspiration to go vegan overnight, um, it will be a little bit difficult. So I, I said that went to Stan and he started attacking himself. <laughs> <laughs> it was a lapsus, a Freudian lapsus. It's like, no, vegan, never. So yeah, for Stan, it would be very difficult to go vegan overnight. Stan is the cat once again. Um, so perhaps you can start reducing. Maybe reduction of intake is much better. So for one day a week, you don't eat meat. That's a day of compassion. That's a day without harming. 
If you do two days a week, it's two days without harming. If you do a meal, it's one meal without harming or with less harming anyway. If you're ready, do, uh, do that. Perhaps you're vegetarian. Actually, if, sorry, if you're ready, like substantially like decreased your intake of meal, perhaps you can switch to vegetarianism. If you're ready vegetarian, perhaps you can switch to vegan. If you're ready vegan, perhaps start thinking, well, how can I actually, perhaps I can, instead of buying at the uh, supermarket, I can actually like support my local farmer. If you're ready supporting your local farmer and buying things locally, so impacting less the planet, perhaps you can grow your own. So really looking, rather than saying black and white, really looking at how can we improve ourselves? How can we look at um, creating less harm in society? Harming less, but with a realistic approach rather than um, you know, trying to do something so quickly overnight and then failing and then feeling bad about ourselves and feeling inadequate and not, and then going, okay, either I go vegan or I, I keep on eating meat five times a day, however, like many times people eat meat here. And also really understanding also where we're getting the meat if we're meat eaters. There's a huge difference between supporting factory farming and uh, local factories, they, they're still killing, but you know, it's quite a huge difference between the Holocaust of animals and the killing of animals. So there's always, 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 in every single um, case, there's an opportunity to, to do less harm. And that's what I would say is my advice for each individual to always consider every single day, how can I harm less other beings, humans, non-humans, and the planet that supports both. Okay, and that's the last question. So thank you very much, Aya Soma, for sharing words of Dhamma. And thank you to everyone who joined in this evening. And hopefully we'll see you again tomorrow morning for more sutta study and tomorrow evening for continuing our series on the 10 parami. Will right. it be Ayasoma or will it be Bhante Sutazo? You will only find out <laughs> tomorrow evening. Well, I think that democracy has voted for Ayasoma, so that's probably who we'll see. So. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I may have stacked the vote on this one. <laughs> Uh, anyway, thank you so much, and we'll see you next time. Sadu, sadu, sadu.